I summer school. So, oh, let, let's get Chimel to. Uh, Chimel, yeah. Do, do, Chimel, do, do you know who who has the right to uh, allow uh, Chandan to share the screen? Hi, Chandan. Hi, Pencha. Hi, Chimel. Hey, 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 Chimel. Do you know who, who has the right to allow Chandan to share the screen? Oh. He apparently could not share the screen. Yeah, it seems like the host has to allow who's me to host? share this. Yeah, do you know who's the host? Uh, uh, well, oh, I don't know. Uh, Baba Chimel said this up. No, no, no. Chimel is the host. Yeah, am I? Yeah, yeah, Chimel is the host. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me do that. So let's see. Mm. So if I go to participants. Oh yes, I'm a host. Okay, I'll also make Pencheng co-host. So Chenna, can you try now? Okay. 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 Uh, yeah. Okay. Good. I mean, your your talk is very timely. We're gonna to try to do this experiment tomorrow. Oh, <laughs> awesome! Really? <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> very timely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we, we our sample was shifted to them. Uh, they received it this morning. So you have single crystals, right? Of yeah, yeah, we have single crystals. Yeah. But which alkali do you have? You have cesium, uh, potassium. Cesium, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that seems like it's the most studied. I mean, cesium has a TC, the highest TC, right? I suppose, yeah. It's like 94, I think. And the, no, that's the, TC. the uh, that's TC a shot that's the way of the TC. Yeah, three TC. Three What's the TC, one point something? A three, three Kelvin, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, potassium is one point something Kelvin. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, oh, Chimel, Chimel, the, 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 the MSR paper was posted on our archive last I know. night. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, these people are speed of light, right? They're very, very fast. I mean, yeah. But Penchi, you made the materials yourself? No, 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 no. This was, uh, I mean, I, I, did, I did not, you know, want to do, I, I did not want to study this, right? Uh, the, uh, Jian Xin, you know, he, he was pushing me for it. Uh, Jian, eh? So, so he, he, he all, all the material came from them? No, 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 it did not come from him. He, he connected with a guy in China. Uh, that okay. guy I know, I know as well, very well, yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. so, so they made the material. They made a lot of material for us. I mean, they made like almost two grams, like maybe maybe 400, 400 pieces. Yeah, they, made it a, they made it impossible for you to say no. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> yeah. So we're going to do two experiments. We're going to do one experiment starting from tomorrow to look at phonons. And then we're going to do another. I mean, maybe we'll look at magnetism as well, but I don't think there's magnetism. Well, the phonon, would be very, phonon itself would be very interesting. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna knock out the uh, the phonon to see whether there's any softening mm -hmm. across uh, across the charge ordering temperature. Yeah. Right. So, where do you do these experiments these days? Oh, oh this particular experiment is going to be done in France. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, none of us are going. So nobody's <laughs> traveling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The time by the local contact. Mm. So we tell them exactly what to do. So they do it for us, yeah. And then the uh, the small angle experiment will be done at RNL. Mm -hmm. So so th that will be that's going to be uh, mid mid July. Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. Do you plan to study superconductivity as well, or just the CDW? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, uh, flux. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, for the, the for both of them go cross TC. Yes. We, I mean, 3K mm -hmm. is quite easy because 3K, we can easily cool down to 2K, 1.8K. Mm -hmm. So this mu SI indicated that there's multiple gaps, right? I yeah. Think, I don't think mu I mean, is, how, how can uh, I mean, in, I think basically from, just whether there is. Go ahead. Yeah. Tommy. No, just I think whether there is a broken time reversal or not. Yeah, I don't think mu SI can tell the gap. I mean, well, they, they measure penetration gaps. Yeah, they can super food density, right? Yeah, yeah. but they, 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 they have no I guess the statement is that there are two features in the temperature dependence. 
Well, you can look at the paper, right? I mean, yeah. it's, but it's yeah. not very, I don't think it's very solid. Well, it's, uh, yeah. it's an indication. Mm -hmm. So I told my students to show up. I mean, I mean, these days, you know, you can't, you can't trust. I, I tell them to show up, but I mean, they, they may or may not show up. <laughs> also, also, pension, this is the 4th of July week, right? Almost. So. <laughs> yeah, but, but, you know. You've got to do something, you have to do something, right? But what can you say about CPU connectivity for measuring uh, four nodes? Oh, we will know basically whether it's the PCS, right? I mean, if PCS. Oh, oh you want to check that possibility, sure. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Phone on phone on line ship will change, right? Mm -hmm. I, actually, I, I personally, I think it is the PCS. I mean, you guys all excited for nothing, yeah. I could be wrong. I, I, many times I'm wrong, so. <laughs> <We'll see. laughs> I, 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 there's no warranty, right? There's no guarantee. <laughs> Zero guarantee, no warranty whatsoever. <laughs> Uh, I haven't seen any of my students showing up. Let me let me put this link there. Okay, wh where's your link? Oh, maybe I should. Yeah, maybe a good idea. Can, 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 oh. can you send the link again? Yeah, to everyone. Yeah, I'll send to. Let me see. Yeah, I, I found it. I'll, I'll TC type to my students. You can also pension. You can also send to C L N D M A T M A T Candemat advice at edu. That saves me from sending mm -hmm. that email. If you send to C O N D M A T M A T Candemat advice at edu, everybody will receive it. Oh, C C what? C M O N D C O N D M oh, count, C O N D. Okay, count yeah. math. M A T. Yeah. M A T. Is, is there a dash in between? No. Just, uh... oh, just one word, count math. Mm -hmm. At advice.edu. I think usually Barbara does it, but it's a summer time. Okay, okay. send. Okay. Well, should, should we get started or wait, wait one or two more minutes? Oh, okay, probably just get it started. Okay, let me. You decide. decide. Yeah, okay. Yeah, great. Yeah, so thanks everyone for showing up. Uh, today's the 4th of July weekend, that's what uh, Chimiao was saying. But, but this topic is actually quite timely and very interesting. Uh, every day, there are a couple of papers on the archive, you know, on, on, this, uh, on this material. So it's great that, uh, yeah. It's great that uh, Chandan is going to be able to talk about this. Actually, I, I met him like more than 10 years ago when I was giving a talk at the Purdue when he was a, stu a graduate student. Yeah, I was just <laughs> I, can't, I, can't, I, can't remember, I can't remember the topic of my talk, but I remember <laughs> I <was> meeting him. <laughs> so, yeah, anyhow, so, so he graduated from Purdue uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with the Zheng Ping Hu as his uh, thesis advisor. And you got your PhD in 2015? Yeah. Correct. Yeah, and then he did his uh, first postdoc at uh, at uh, University of Illinois Urbana Champaign, and then and then he did another postdoc uh, with uh, uh, I guess at, with Peter Hirschfield at uh, Florida. Now now he's uh, uh, just joined us uh, at Rice from September 2020. Yeah. Okay. So he's going to talk about the uh, density wave order in topological Kagumi metals. So welcome. Yeah. Benton. Yeah. It's all thanks, Benton. Thank you, yeah. and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, today, uh, I will be talking to you about, can you hear me, by the way? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, today I'll be talking to you about uh, this uh, new, newly discovered topological Kagome metals. Uh, and there were some recent uh, observations of uh, density wave orders, uh, especially in the 135 uh, ternary compounds. And... Uh, I want to give our perspective of the broken time reversal symmetry that was observed in this system. So before I begin, I want to thank uh, uh, my collaborators, 
uh, the two students, Hao Yu Hu and Lei Chen, who, are, uh, who did many of the calculations uh, that I'm going to talk about, and also uh, Professor Chumiaosi. Okay, um, so for those of you who are already experts in this topic, I want to give a quick two slide summary of the talk. Uh, so the basic statement of the problem is really simple. Let's say you have a collection of bands that are uh, crossing the Fermi level with some overall bandwidth W0. And you slowly turn on interactions. Uh, let's say you have a on-site Hubbard U and a next nearest neighbor density, density type interaction. And for low enough interactions, um, you have the characteristics of a Fermi liquid retained uh, where you have gapless excitations. But the moment you crank up these interactions, it's now well known that uh, novel phases of correlated matter emerge. You can have a modern slating phase, you can have a density wave order, you can have a pneumatic, so on and so forth. But in this talk, I will uh, try to address the question, uh, what happens if some of these bands that are crossing the Fermi level have a non-trivial topological character? So in other words, there is some ingredient in the problem. It could be spin orbit coupling, or it could be an internal symmetry in the system that causes these bands to become, to have a non-trivial churn number. And so the question I will ask is, let's say I'm gonna crank up these interactions and make it comparable to W0, uh, what would be the role of topology on the correlated phases? And the final answer to this, which I will try to hopefully convince you is that uh, there is this phase diagram that we obtain where on the x-axis you have the on-site Hubbard interaction U. On the y-axis, you have a uh, next nearest neighbor density type interaction V prime. And the basic uh, focus of this talk is going to be the density wave phase, which occurs at large V prime. And this little t that you see here denotes that this density wave order breaks time reversal symmetry. And the, and the focus of this talk is going to be as to how to obtain this broken time reversal symmetry from the topological, the topologically non-trivial character of the bands. Okay, so that's the relationship I'm going to uh, establish. And I will, and recently some of uh, STM experiments have actually confirmed uh, this broken time reversal symmetry as well as uh, the MUSR experiments. So I will come to all of this uh, in the course of this talk. Okay, um, so what are charge density waves? The simplest way to understand charge density waves uh, and its mechanism is in one dimension, where at very high temperatures, let's say you have a collection of uh, atoms with a single orbital, say an S orbital, and each orbital gives rise to one electron. And at high temperatures, uh, Pyrrhals found that the most stable configuration corresponds to a constant lattice spacing of A. However, if you reduce the temperature, it was uh, proved that there is this lattice distortion that occurs where the, the lattice constant doubles from A to 2A. Okay, so accordingly, the charge modulation of the electron can also be seen in experiment. And what is the main reason for why this instability happens? Pyrrhal suggested that it is uh, uh, really because there is an extra hybridization that happens between the non-bonding electrons at half the balloon zone boundary. And what he proved was that the gain in electronic energy due to the formation of this gap 
exceeds the cost of the lattice distortion. Okay, and then he said that the charge density wave is characterized by a wave vector. In the case of a one dimensional system, this wave vector is simply 2kf, which is the vector that connects the two non bonding orbitals. This idea can be generalized to a higher dimension case where instead of having a point like Fermi surface, you have a nested Fermi surface. And the characteristic CDW wave vector is uh, basically the vector that connects regions of the Fermi surface that are uh, shifted by a constant wave vector. Okay, so this was the simple me mechanism that, will, that is well established. And in fact, uh, there are several experimental consequences of uh, such a mechanism. The first is given you have a formation of a gap and your chemical potential is right in between, one should expect a metal insulator transition exactly at the CDW wave vector. The second is that there should be a structural transition that is observable, perhaps with uh, some sort of a neutron diffraction or an X-ray diffraction experiment. There's also the cone anomaly, which is really the softening of the acoustic phonon modes exactly at the CDW wave vector. And given that this is a Fermi surface phenomena where you have regions of the Fermi surface that are separated from one another by a constant Q, one should be able to see that uh, the, 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 there are regions that are, uh, that are observable in experiments such as ARPIS. Okay, so this is what one would theoretically at least expect from a Pyrrhals type uh, mechanism. And in fact, uh, this is very well established in uh, quasi 1D organic sols, where for example, uh, in this particular organic system, there is a metal, insul metal insulated transition at the CDW wave uh, transition temperature. There is a softening of the phonon mode at the CDW wave vector. There are regions of the Fermi surface that are nested by the CDW wave vector. And finally, there is a reorganization of the electronic density uh, to double the original unit cell. Okay, so these are all experiments that have been performed and have been well established uh, to show that the Pyrrhals mechanism holds at least in these one dimensional uh, systems. However, it turns out that the moment you uh, go to higher dimensions, uh, this mechanism sometimes may not really uh, hold in all of its aspects. So for example, in this niobium disilinide, it was seen that there is the structural distortion and formation of an electronic modulated state, but there is no Fermi surface nesting. Okay, similarly, in the cuprates, it was found that you don't see a cone anomaly at the CDW wave vector. So there is a question of whether or not if one finds a new system where there is a charge density wave observed, the mechanism that drives it is the Pyrrhals mechanism or not. Okay, so that's a legitimate question one can ask given any new system that hosts a charge density wave. And so let's try and uh, understand the phenomenology of the 135 ternary compounds and see where it fits into this overall picture. So the 135 system contains a Kagome network of atoms formed by the vanadium atom. And at the center of the hexagon, you have the alkali atom. And at the center of the triangle, you have the antimony atom. It turns out that the network of the antimony and the vanadium is quite strong. And the cleavage of the crystal happens between 
the antimony and the cesium. Okay, and the calculated band structure shows a Van Hove singularity at the end point, a Dirac cone at the K point, and the predominant orbital character close to the Van Hove singularity is the D wave, the, the D orbital character of the vanadium, whereas at the gamma point, it is the PZ orbital of the antimony. Okay, so that's the basic uh, lattice structure and the band structure for the 135 compounds. And the clearest evidence so far for a charge density wave uh, was seen in STM experiments, that is a Fourier transform of uh, the charge modulation. So essentially what you see here, uh, the green circles right here, they, are, they correspond to the Bragg peaks of the triangular lattice, okay? That forms the hexagon. And exactly at half the Bragg scattering you see the emergence of the CDW wave vector exactly at the M point. Okay, so the M point falls one half of the Bragg scattering wave vector. The other important point is that in between, there is no intensity seen at the K point. Okay, so it seems like this modulated wave vector is an M point type of an order and not a K point type of an order. And many of these experiments were reproduced by several other groups. And it seems like uh, many of their predictions are consistent with each other. And so that's neat. So there is evidence of a CDW phase. And in fact, some of the other uh, thermodynamic measurements as well as transport measurements saw a kink-like feature at around 94 Kelvin, indicating a CDW type transition. And also inelastic X-ray scattering measurements found there are peaks that show up supporting a CDW type transition. So, so can, I, fact, can I ask, can I ask sure. a question? Yeah, sure. so, so STM is not sensitive to the C-axis modulation, right? But uh, uh, X-ray scattering experiments seem to suggest the, the, the charge ordinary is actually three-dimensional. So how, yeah. how, do, how, how do these guys reconcile these two uh, observations? Uh, I think maybe the projection of the 3D order is exactly the 2D order that these people see. No, but I mean, are you saying that the STM integrates the C-axis or they, they don't? I mean, they don't STM even observe also, this. Yeah. Yeah, STM has no C-axis modulation Correct. sensitivity, right? Correct. But, but but in fact, all, all the charge ordering, at least in I mean, some of the material, at least in cesium, might seem to be happening uh, at the half integer point along the c-axis. Yeah. So I think this was the Humiao experiment where they see the three D charge order in in right, elastic right, right, in right, in, right. Uh, in elastic X ray scattering. No elastic X ray scattering. Not in elastic. Elastic. Elastic, elastic X ray scattering. Yeah. Right. I, I think I think as far as I understand the 2D, if, if you project the 3D CDW that you observe in the elastic X-ray scattering, you get the imprint of the 2D CDW that was seen in STM. Okay. So the STM does not see the 3D order, sure, I agree. Okay. So I think I'll come back to this issue of 3D versus 2D soon at some point. Uh, but uh, for now, uh, we will take into uh, 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 consideration the 2D order that was seen in STM. Okay, that's the thing we will take into account. Okay, and this was also seen in other uh, 135 compounds. And also there were uh, these recent measurements, and I think this uh, points to the same paper that was uh, that Peng Chen was just talking about, where they did uh, uh, X-ray scattering measurements and extracted the, the longitudinal dispersion of the acoustic phonon and found that above 
and below the, the CDW transition temperature, there is no dip in the dispersion. And as a result, this tells you that there is no cone anomaly that typically one sees in a, in a, in a piles type mechanism. Okay, so this is something that is kind of a characteristic feature of the 135 systems. Yeah, so this is where I have a main problem, right? Because, uh, I mean, I don't know, I haven't read this paper carefully enough to know that whether this charge ordering here, is it happening at the, uh, the three dimensional, you know, three dimensional um, uh, C along the half position or, or uh, C along zero position? Because they only look at the C along zero position. If the charge ordering actually occurs at the C along the 0, 0, 0 0.5 position, now you would not expect to see a cone anomaly here. And the reason being, you know, you see cone anomaly because you have a new Bragg peak. A new Bragg peak, typically any Bragg peak are equivalent, right? So it re requires, uh, requires uh, you know, renormalize the phonon. And that's why, you know, by definition, you have to, you have to have an acoustic phonon there. So, so, uh, so yeah. you're saying that, so you're saying that basically if, uh, uh, if there is a 3D charge order, one shouldn't really expect to see a, no. uh, uh, to yeah. see a, a, a cone anomaly along this direction, right? That's what yeah. you're trying to say. Yeah, yeah, L equal to zero, right. Yeah, so I think uh, perhaps in the experiments that they, in the data they presented, they don't really present, at least to my knowledge, the acoustic phonon data along the C-axis direction. Yeah, so, so it's so entire. I'm, 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 yeah, it's premature, this claim. Yeah, I'm not sure it's, it's completely, you know, solved, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, maybe it's possible that if they looked at the dispersion along the C-axis, they may see a, uh, they may see a, a cone anomaly. But I think from the paper itself, it was, it's maybe not entirely clear. I agree with you, yeah. So, so for now, let's uh, take these claims uh, uh, at face value and uh, you will see that uh, the 135 system contains features that are kind of distinct from what you would expect uh, in a conventional pyrals type mechanism. Okay, so this is already a good reason to think about the charge density wave phase in the 135 compound, okay? But it turns out that there are even more interesting, in my personal humble opinion, uh, features of the 135 system and that is how the CDW peaks behave as a function of the flipping of the magnetic field. Okay, so it turns out that the intensities of these peaks are sensitive to the direction. So, so I, have a, I have another yeah. question uh, go sure. back, going back. To, so if you go back to the last slide, you say there's no structural transition, but then yeah. you talk about the Bragg peaks that come in. Which yeah, that's a good you, point. You do have a structural transition. So, I mean, that's totally yeah, inconsistent. It, yeah, it does seem inconsistent. And so it turns out that yeah. if you look at the plane uh, transport properties, the very first set of experiments that came out, they always claim that in the uh, CDW phase, they don't see any structural distortion. But well, however, you have, a, you, you have yeah. a Brad peak, right? I mean, Jeff is absolutely correct. You have a Brad peak. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 I agree. I, I agree. No, I don't know what they were smoking when they wrote the paper, but uh, sure. But, you know, it's just wrong. Uh, Jeff, yeah. Jeff, so, uh, <laughs> so let me, yeah, I agree. So there are two sets of experiments. Okay. So one is the transport based experiments, and the other is the STM based experiments. Okay. The transport based experiments somehow claim that if they look at the anomalies that show up at the CDW transition temperatures below the CDW transition, they really see that the Kagome lattice is perfectly uh, showing no structural distortion. Perhaps they did some anisotropic measurements and found that to be true. But so somehow how, it seems how, how to- do, How do transport measurements determine the crystal structure, I mean? Well, perhaps, well, if, they, if you see that there is some uh, I mean, an isotropy be, between. No, no. I mean, they must, I mean, must be smoking something, right? A transfer measurement cannot determine crystal structure. <laughs> so <laughs> unless, unless I'm totally idiot. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I think there are two claims. So we, I okay. just want to point out that there are two claims. One claim is from the transport measurements, mm -hmm. and the other claim is from the STM measurements. 
Right. So there seems to be that there is this contradiction and perhaps uh, new measurements can uh, tell us whether or not there really is a structural distortion or not. Yeah, but the bottom line is the transform, transform measurement cannot tell whether there's a structural phase transition or not. I mean, that, that's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, how can the transform measurement tell you whether there's a structural phase transition or not? But it can I mean, tell you if there's an anisotropy, an right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. But, but that, doesn't, yeah. that doesn't you know, tell you whether there's a structural phase transition or not, right? So you're saying that one should trust the STM experiment more in this context. Right? STM measurement, you know, can potentially tell you, I mean, if they do Fourier transform, you know, then, then if new peaks popping up in Fourier transform, yeah, that, that's, that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. And also a diffraction experiment, like Jeff was saying, a second yeah. experiment is, is guaranteed to be correct. I mean, right. if the second, I mean, of course, if, assuming the signal is genuine, it's not an okay. artifact of some sort, which, which we don't believe, right? Yeah. Okay. 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 So I think that's good to know. So just to keep in mind that there are two, these two sets of experiments and uh, we'll see what happens. Okay. But clearly there is no metal insulator transition. So if you look at these uh, uh, previous experiments I showed you, uh, typically in a pyrrhal type mechanism, you will see that the resistivity increases uh, at the transition temperature. But in this case, it seems to go down continuously. Okay, so that's something also to keep in mind that is different from a conventional CDW type phase. Yeah, but, but that, that's, that's under debate as well, right? Because if you think about it, the transport measurement is determined by the entire Fermi surface phenomena. Your resistivity is determined not only by the speed of, of the electrons, but also by the electron density, right? You yeah. can have a small portion of the, the, the Fermi surface that's gapped due yeah. to the power transition, where other parts of your electron velocity increases, you can yeah. still have resistivity drop. So this doesn't tell you whether there's a you know power transition or not. I yeah, I think, yeah, I think but if, at if least... It, at the, yeah. So if you look at your resistivity curves, you have a singularity. If you yeah. took the derivative of the, of the curve, you would find something is happening there. Yeah. So you can, you, you can say that you don't feel the transition uh, on the transport. You, you do feel something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, Alo is right. I mean, so basically, transport is measuring overall electronic property. It doesn't really tell you what happens ne near the power transition, right? right. So you, can still, you can still have a gap opening. Yeah. It's harder to interpret, but it tells you that something happens. Yes, I agree completely. Um, right. Sorry, sorry to keep. Maybe I can just. Just uh, make a remark, if I don't, uh, if that's okay, Pen Chen. Um, I think what the uh, Chandler is saying that he's not saying that there's no feature uh, in the transport. What he's saying is that uh, if you have a huge amount of Fermi surface that's gapped out, uh, you would expect to see some. You you might expect that resistivity shows some upturn, and that's not seen now. Uh, no, no, but. But, but, but what I'm saying is that the resistivity upturn is dictated by two things, right? By electron density and also by the velocity of those electrons. What is the electron velocity yeah, of other parts of Fermi surface? It's a question of what is the reference point? Uh, do you mm -hmm. consider the anchoring point as more or less 100% of Fermi surface that's wiped out? Or do you consider the anchoring point as small portion of Fermi surface that's affected by the charge density wave. Yeah, I mean, based on these data, it seems to be like only small portion of it, right? I mean, maybe Gersh has some comment. Gersh, Gersh you want to comment? Do you have anything on the, on the whole yeah. thing? Uh, I, let, let, me, let me make this comment. I'm, I'm sorry, Henry. Uh, so first of all, uh, Raman does show new modes, new phonon modes below the transition. So definitely there is a structured transition. There's no, there's no doubt about that. Okay. So we can, we can say that the distortion is weak, the modes are weak relative to the, but uh, they are there and they are consistent with, with not broken C3 symmetry. So there is no, uh, no or something like that. Uh, the second thing, uh, engine, uh, uh, you, you're correct, but there is also a third component, which is scattering rate, right? Which contributes to conductivity or resistivity. So when the gap opens up, the scattering drops, and, and that's why your conductivity increases, your resistivity drops. Okay. Right. Uh, sorry, sorry, Chanta, you can continue, yeah. No, I think I, think I agree that uh, uh, perhaps there are some conflicting uh, uh, measurements coming, and maybe there should be a more complete understanding of how to uh, see that there is actually a drop in the resistivity below T3 
PCTW. That's all I'm trying to say. And I think uh, the fact that there is this anomaly tells you that there is something going on. The question is, why does it continue to go down? Why does the resistivity continue to go down below the CDW transition temperature? And I think that's, that's something one needs to uh, figure out. But there is absolutely no doubt that there is a structural transition. That's what I'm telling. Okay, okay, okay. All right, so, um, so the other thing I was trying to point out here is that the intensity of these peaks are uh, somehow sensitive to the, the direction of the magnetic field. Okay, so this is the intensity for plus two Tesla, and this is the intensity of the endpoint peaks for minus two Tesla. And as you can see, the intensity of the smallest peak increases and the intensity of the largest peak decreases. Okay, and uh, the authors here claim that this is uh, 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 the evidence of some sort of a, a chirality that is present in the CDW phase and uh, perhaps leads to a broken time reversal symmetry CDW phase. So this was the first evidence that, uh, uh, that exists for the broken time reversal symmetry. And in fact, just yesterday, as uh, Peng Cheng and Chimya were saying, um, there was this recent MUSR experiment that came out that showed that there is an increase in the muon decay below the CDW transition temperature, indicating that there is good evidence of a broken time reversal symmetry phase in the CDW, uh, in the, in the CDW phase. Okay, so this is the first thing that kind, that kind of seems to be a, a property that is unique to the 135 system and absent in all the other well-known CDW systems. Okay, so this is the first uh, interesting property. And the second is that if you look at DFT calculations, um, the bands crossing the Fermi level seem to have a very small direct gap separating the, the bands. And as a result, one can define, uh, one can calculate a Fouquet invariant. And it was found that the bands crossing the Fermi level have a non-zero churn number. Okay, so this, this seems interesting. And it, this, was a prop, this is a property that was also seen in the other uh, 135 systems. And so this kind of gives an indication that there are two very unique properties in the 135 systems. One is the broken time reversal symmetry, and the other is the presence of topologically non-trivial bands crossing the Fermi level. And so perhaps uh, we had a suspicion that these two properties could be uh, related to each other. Okay, so that is the perspective I will take in this talk. And so I will try to refine the problem a little bit more and ask the following question. So let's say that you have a collection of bands crossing the Fermi level with a large bandwidth W0, and you slowly turn on the interaction. And when this interaction is much smaller than the bandwidth, you're having a gapless phase. However, when this interaction becomes comparable to W0, correlated phase, phases emerge. Uh, density waves, mod insulators, so on and so forth. Now let's say that through some mechanism, okay, it could be some crystal symmetry that is present or spin orbit coupling that leads to small gaps, small direct gaps that separate these bands. Okay, so in this case, there are two effects. The first effect is that given you have these tiny gaps, correlated phases already start to emerge when the interactions are comparable to the tiny bandwidth of these bands near the Fermi level, but much smaller than the overall bandwidth W0, okay? So what, does, what this means is that if you want to have an effective description of these bands, you need to write an effective model for just the bands crossing the Fermi level in such a way that your correlated phases start to emerge in this regime. 
The second is that given these bands have non-trivial topology, we need to find a formalism that deals with the non-trivial topology of the bands. Okay, so these, this is going to be the big question we will ask. What is the nature of correlated phases derived from topologically non-trivial bands? And we will specifically be interested in the regime where U is comparable to the tiny composite bandwidth, but much smaller than W0, the overall bandwidth. Okay, so the question is, why is it a problem? Like, why is it a problem that when the bands crossing the, topolo uh, the Fermi surface are, are topologically non-trivial? Because naively, if you think about it, uh, all you really need for a correlated phase is the ratio of U over W, that is the interaction and the bandwidth. But however, if you have a closer examination, you will see that any strongly correlated model, there is an assumption that there are exponentially localized one year arbitrals. Okay, you, you could, for example, choose the Hubbard model or you could write a TJ model. At the end of the day, there is this assumption that there exists well localized one year arbitrals. However, such a localized one year arbitral description is not assured when the bands crossing the Fermi level are topologically non-trivial, okay? But then you may ask why at all demand such uh, exponential localization of the one-year functions? I mean, one could just simply work with perhaps one-year functions that are having a power law localization, right? And the answer to that is exponential localization assures you that you have preserved all the essential physics that you want to describe. Okay, so it turns out that, let's say you want to write a simple tight binding model. It could be in momentum space, or it could be in real space. You want to be able to capture the essential physics with a small number of parameters. But in the case, in the case of trivial systems, it turns out that the cost of writing a tight binding model or in momentum space or real space is quite minimal. That is, you will probably get uh, certain quantitative dis uh, distinctions. But however, if your bands crossing the Fermi level are topologically non-trivial, it turns out that you will, you will completely lose important physics by trying to write uh, tight binding models if they are not exponentially localized. Okay, so that's an important point. And hopefully in the course of this talk, I will show you that if you did not perform a proper one-year localization, you will completely miss the broken time reversal symmetry that uh, we propose. Okay, so why, why is one-year localization, why does it have anything to do with topology? So to see this, one can consider uh, one year function that is, let's say, uh, centered around the origin. And we are looking at what happens at some distance much far away from the center. Okay, so given that the one year function is a Fourier transform of the block function, you have this prefactor uk of zero times an exponential that is oscillating very fast. Now, if provided UK of zero is well behaved, there is a cancellation of this wildly oscillating exponential and you get exponential localization. Okay, this is a very naive way to think about uh, topology and localization. But it turns out that in the case of trivial bands, UK of zero is smooth throughout the Brillouin zone and also periodic in the reciprocal lattice vector G. However, in the case of topologically non-trivial systems, the prefactor UK of zero, which is the block component, cannot at the same time both be smooth and periodic in the reciprocal lattice vector G. 
And as a result, there is no assurance that you have exponentially localized one year functions when the bands crossing the Fermi level are topologically non trivial. Okay, so we have to take this case by case. And let's see what happens when you have a when you have a single band that is crossing the Fermi level. And so in the case that the single band is topologically trivial, we know that the block functions are smooth throughout the balloon zone and have the have the translation properties of the reciprocal lattice vector. And as a result, one says that the block function is smooth on a torus. In the case that the band is topologically non-trivial, uh, it is well known in uh, topological band theory that the best you can do is write a smooth block function on a cylinder uh, rather than a torus. Okay, so this is the case for a single band crossing the Fermi level. Now let's say there are two bands crossing the Fermi level. Okay, now there are two options. The two bands can have the same Chern number, in which case you go back to the previous scenario. But in the case that the two bands have equal and opposite Chern numbers, for example, as you would get with a Kramer's pair of bands in the presence of spin orbit coupling, it turns out that one can take a linear combination of these two block bands with equal and opposite shown numbers in such a way that you can end up with exponentially localized trivial one year functions. Okay, so the question is what is this linear combination that does that for you? And it turns out that this problem was solved by Solyanov and Vanderbilt 10 years ago, where they suggested that you can use the matrix UH which is simply the uh, matrix of eigenvectors of the Haldane model that does this linear transformation for you. And what they showed is that indeed, you get two block functions that have individual churn numbers to be zero and are exponentially localized. Okay, so we can use this formalism to solve our problem. At this point, you may ask, well, if you are having two block functions with trivial churn numbers, what happened to the topology? Okay, so has the topology vanished? It turns out that there is the imprints of topology are still present in the system in the following two ways. The first is that given you started with a Kramer's pair of bands, after the one-yearization process, that is after this transformation that you did with the Haldane matrix, you end up with two states that are no longer Kramer's pairs. Okay, so this gives you a hint that, for example, uh, and we will see this later, if you want to calculate a density operator in one basis, it will turn out to have both density type and spin type contributions in the other basis. Okay, so this will, uh, will, will cause a mixing between the density and the spin operator. And similarly, the other imprint of topology is that the two one-year functions no longer share the same one-year center. So before the one-yearization process, you had a Kramer's pair of bands that are not exponentially localized, but share the same one-year center. But after the one-yearization process, you have two exponentially localized one-year functions that are split uh, in real space. Okay, and this is another important consequence of the non-trivial topology. And we will see that the effect of the splitting is that you can never write a strictly local interaction in real space. Okay, so there is always a component of interaction or hopping that spills over to the nearest neighbor uh, unit cells. Okay, so those are the two important consequences of topology that one needs to keep in mind when one writes a model uh, for the topologically non-trivial bands. Okay, so now let's try and apply this uh, for the Kagome Hamiltonian. 
that is applicable to the 135 systems. Now, the entire band structure of the 135 system is uh, reasonably complicated. So we are gonna use a minimal model that uh, helps us bring out the physics of what happens when you have topologically non-trivial bands crossing the Fermi level. So the band part of the Hamiltonian, we choose a nearest neighbor and a next nearest neighbor hopping and spin arbit coupling. And for the interactions, we use the onside Hubbard U and the next nearest neighbor Hubbard U as well. So this will be our high energy model where we have all the bands present in the system. So in the absence of any spin arbit coupling, you have three pairs of bands, okay? There is a quadratic touching at the gamma point and a Dirac cone at the K point. Once you add the spin arbit coupling, you will have three pairs of bands. The lowest and the topmost have equal and opposite churn numbers, whereas the one in the center has a zero churn number. So what we want to do now is we want to write an effective model just for the lowest two bands by integrating out or projecting out the bands that are far away from the bands of our interest. Okay, so that's gonna be our goal. And given that we know how to do this following the procedure of uh, Solyonov and Vanderbilt, we can construct these exponentially localized one-year functions. So you will have two one-year functions because we have two bands. And the first one-year function is centered around the upright triangle of the Kagome lattice, okay? And the second one-year function is centered around the inverted triangle of the Kagome lattice. So as you can see, the one-year center of the two one-year functions are not the same. You can try to smoothen your one-year functions how much way you want. You can try to make it as localized as possible, but you will find that the two one-year centers can never be the same as long as they are exponentially localized. Okay, and you will see that these one-year functions uh, satisfy all the properties of a block function. That is, you want to make sure that they satisfy the reciprocal lattice vector translations, that they are smooth throughout, and also have a zero churn number. Okay, so just to see quickly what the Haldane rotation is Sorry, doing. Can I, yeah. can I ask a question? Sure. What what happens with the antimony in this picture? Because you are showing us vanadium bands. Yeah. And where, ha where has disappeared the antimony site? Right. So in the effective model that we have written, we have only considered the Kagome bands because the Kagome bands are coming from vanadium and they contribute to the non-trivial topology. The vanadium atoms, if, if you consider the band structure, band structure of the vanadium, they don't really contribute to the non-trivial topology. So from our perspective, if topology is related to the CDW, uh, the broken time reversal symmetry phase, we, we think that the vanadium atoms are, are the most important for this physics. And so for our considerations, uh, we have neglected the contributions of the vanadium, uh, oh, sorry, of the antimony. Antimony. Yeah, antimony. That yeah. seems a little bit strange because you expect to get at least the large W should come from the antimony bands. Well, so, yes. Yeah, so, so the question is, what is responsible for the broken time reversal symmetry? Okay, so indeed, there is a large W coming from the antimony bands, but the large W is not directly going to contribute to the broken time reversal symmetry phase. And so, in principle, one can, you're right, one should include the antimony p orbitals. And in fact, it may even change the nature uh, of the transition. Perhaps it could be, you know, it could change the value of the transition boundary. But the fact that there is broken time reversal symmetry will not be affected by the inclusion of the antimony bands. 
Okay. This is an assumption. Yes. But, well, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, a reasonable assumption given that the topological character of the bands are coming from the Kagome lattice. Mm -hmm. The Kagome lattice is coming from the vanadium atoms. So I think it's an assumption, but I think it's a reasonable assumption. Okay. okay. So uh, what is the Haldane rotation exactly doing? So it's taking the two one year functions that are not exponentially localized and share the same one year center. And then uh, you get two exponentially localized one year functions that do not share the same one year center. And from now on, I will denote as C and C dagger the electrons in the original uh, for the or for the original one year functions without the Haldane rotation, and B and D B dagger for the one year orbitals after the Haldane rotation. And in principle, one can go back and forth between these two sets of bases by either performing a rotation by UH or a UH inverse. Okay, so uh, that's the basic setup. And with that, we can write an effective uh, two band Hamiltonian just for the two one functions for the two lowest bands by projecting out all the other high energy bands. And what you get here is uh, two terms. Uh, one is the non-interacting term, and the other is the four fermion interaction term. Um, the important thing here is that these parameters U depend on what one year orbital is under consideration. And um, they, are, uh, they are never local. That is, you will always see that it, ac it acquires non-zero values uh, uh, for nearest neighbor unit cells, but it will never be a constant value, simply given the fact that you have two one-year functions that no longer share the same one-year center. Okay, so this is a strictly non-local Hamiltonian, which you would not have obtained if you had topologically trivial bands. Okay, that's the central uh, theme of this uh, presentation. Okay, so now uh, we want to make sure that the one-yearization works, that is, um, uh, we want to make sure that the effective model reproduces the band structure of the original high energy bands and indeed we see that uh, it does so. Okay, so now uh, what we did is we solved the effective uh, low energy Hamiltonian um, using the slave spin method. For those of you who are not very familiar, the slave spin method is a non perturbative method of uh, solving uh, interacting Hamiltonians that gives rise to, uh, for example, mod insulating phases or density wave orders that would typically not be obtained if uh, one followed a perturbative regime, a perturbative method. Okay, so essentially it's like a variational uh, minimization approach where you minimize the Coulomb interactions. Okay, so with that, I will uh, restate the phase diagram you have on the x-axis uh, on-site Coulomb interaction U. On the y-axis, you have a next nearest neighbor interaction B prime, and you have the topological metal. You have a mod insulator for large U and for large B prime, that is the next nearest neighbor density interaction, you have a density wave order. Uh, as I mentioned before, the important thing here is this little T, which tells you that the density wave order breaks time reversal. Now, the question is, why does the density wave order uh, break time reversal? So just let me give a simple explanation for why this is the case, and then I'll go into some detail for those of you who may be interested. So the simple reason is that, uh, remember I mentioned to you that the slave spin method is a variational minimization approach. That is, you take interactions that are given in the problem and you want to minimize the Coulomb repulsion. And as a result, the configuration that minimizes the Coulomb repulsion consists of both the charge order parameter as well as the spin order parameter to be non-zero. Okay, so the X here simply means that your spin order is along the X direction, but in principle, it could be uh, in any direction depending on 
the direction of the spin arbit coupling you choose. Now, it turns out that the reason why the spin order acquires a non-zero expectation value has to do with the fact that the two one-year centers you started with are no longer having the same, the two one-year functions you started with are no longer having the same one-year center. Okay, so this is the thing I mentioned to you earlier that given that the bands crossing the Fermi level were topologically non-trivial, the two one-year functions can never share the same one-year center. And as a, as a result, this feature results in the expectation value of the spin operator to be non-zero. And as a result, uh, you break time reversal symmetry. Okay, so that's the simple way to understand this. Uh, now let's, for those of you who are interested in the details, basically what happens is, let's say you want to calculate the expectation value of the physical spin. Okay, so if you remember, I told you that I can uh, recast this expectation value in terms of uh, the one-year orbitals. So you have two terms. You have a one-year orbital charge and the one-year orbital spin. Using the variational minimization approach, by minimizing the uh, correlation energy, you will find that the one-year orbital charge is non-zero whereas the one-year orbital spin is zero in the density wave phase, okay? So one can neglect the second term. The important thing here is this prefactor, okay? Remember in this prefactor, N1 and N2 are the distances between the two one-year centers. If the distances between the two one-year centers are zero, that is, if the cases, if the bands are topologically trivial, the expectation value of the spin goes to zero. That is, you have two minus one minus one become zero. Now, in the case where the bands are topologically non-trivial, N1 and N2 are non-zero. And as a result, the expectation value of the spin is non-zero. Okay, so a simple summary of this is that in the case of topologically trivial bands, the expectation value of the charge is non-zero, whereas the expectation value of the spin is zero. The spin is zero. In the case when the bands are topologically non-trivial, the expectation, of, the expectation value of both the charge and the spin operator are zero. And the reason for this is the fact that the one-year centers are, uh, are no longer the same. And as a result, we can conclude that there is a broken time reversal symmetry. Okay, so this is the basic understanding of why topology and time reversal symmetry are uh, related to each other, at least in this problem. Okay, so the, this is a sketch of the density wave order that we get, which is located at the endpoint after Fourier transformation. Essentially, you have uh, a collinear order where uh, you have a charge collinearity as well as a spin collinearity. Now, whether or not this is observed depends on uh, the ratio of the intensities at the various endpoints. Okay, so for example, uh, uh, we know that at least in our calculation, uh, the different endpoints are degenerate. And so uh, uh, depending on exact uh, calculations, one has to uh, determine what the ratios of the different uh, endpoint orders is so that one can see if this collinearity is actually observable in experiments. So just to give a quick outlook of where we are, I wanted to, I hopefully convince you that uh, uh, there is broken time reversal symmetry, at least if not the others, uh, that uh, it's an interesting system to study given this uh, uh, recent MUSR experiment as well as STM experiments. And uh, uh, there are in fact other families where this physics is entirely possible. The first uh, system is the binary Kagome where the, such as the nickel, indium, or iron, tin, and cobalt, tin, so on and so forth, where you have a collection of fat, flat bands either at the Fermi level or slightly away from the Fermi level. And one can write effective models just for these flat bands. And provided there is some evidence of uh, topologically non-trivial physics, one can 
expect that uh, similar physics holds. Uh, there's also a question of uh, uh, other mechanisms that exist in literature for the CDW phase. Uh, one is the Pyrrhals mechanism, which depends on the nesting wave vector versus uh, the topological mechanism that we are presenting in this, that I'm presenting in this talk. And uh, perhaps future experiments will try to uh, help us nail down um, uh, what type of a mechanism is actually relevant for the 135 ternary compounds. Uh, there's a question of what happens when you have a single isolated band crossing the Fermi level. Okay, so remember that uh, in the current talk, what I considered is the ironically simpler case of two bands crossing the Fermi level with equal and opposite shown numbers. But uh, how you deal with a single band crossing the Fermi level and how you deal with the topologically non-trivial character is an outstanding problem that will uh, hopefully be addressed in future works. And of course, there is the elephant in the room, which is superconductivity. Uh, the 135 system shows superconductivity at very low temperatures. Um, the question of what is the nature of the superconductor? Uh, what is the pairing symmetry? Uh, that's an open question. And in fact, uh, the method that we are proposing uh, can also be extended to apply to superconductivity and uh, given the recent MUSR experiment that also observes uh, uh, time reversal symmetry breaking in the superconducting phase tells us that perhaps the mechanism that we are proposing for the CDW also holds for the superconductor, uh, for the superconducting phase. Okay, so with that, I will conclude saying that uh, the 135 tertiary compounds are highly unconventional, uh, mainly because of the fact that you have um, broken time reversal symmetry uh, in the CDW phase. The bands crossing the Fermi level are topologically non-trivial and the, the, there is possibly some connection between this non-trivial topology and uh, the broken time reversal symmetry. And I hope that uh, the method we have provided, uh, which helps deal with topologically non-trivial bands crossing the Fermi level is applicable uh, to the 135 systems. And of course, the fact that the bands uh, uh, are topologically non-trivial means that the one-year functions no longer share the same common one-year center. And this is directly uh, the, uh, the reason why uh, the density wave phase that we see has spin and charge intertwined leading to a uh, broken time reversal symmetry. So with that, I will conclude and thank you all for your attention. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so any, any questions for him? Yes. We have some questions already. Yeah, Han Yu, yeah. I have some eventually. Oh, yes, I... is that me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, that's a very excellent talk uh, because previously we, we haven't had this discussion with uh, Simiao about the nature of this uh, time reverse symmetry breaking. So. Um, I, I get, I think uh, we understand much better. Um, it's really clear uh, from the point where if you have two one-year functions that are uh, not uh, share the same center, then it's entirely understandable. Um, but would you like to uh, have some like easy proof that topological bands cannot have localized one-year? Um, so, uh, so, so that uh, doesn't seem to have been like rigorously established in the beginning of your talk, or is it just a well-known theorem? No, I think this is amazing. That's that's a great question. So, in the talk, whatever explanation I gave with respect to uh, the Fourier transform, if 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 a, if a mathematician hears me give that explanation, they're going to run away. They're not even going to take me seriously. But it turns out that there are very rigorous mathematical proofs that actually show that uh, having topologically non-trivial bands may not give rise to exponentially localized one-year functions. And okay, uh, I, can, I, can point, I can point to some several uh, mathematical works by uh, Giancola Panati and uh, also uh, Marzari. Uh, they, they have some very highly mathematical works, which is uh, beyond my uh, comprehension, unfortunately, that prove these theorems very rigorously. Okay, so it's a very rigorous statement, but uh, uh, for the purpose of this talk and also 
my inability to understand highly mathematical works, I've given the simple explanation. Okay, got it. Uh, a related question is, um, so is it a necessary condition for, so basically you must have a topological non-trivial band to delocalize the Vanya functions or maybe some easier uh, conditions can satisfy the same thing. Because what, what I'm thinking is in this particular case, um, as long as there is strong spinor coupling and your lattice break, somehow breaks inversion symmetry, then I can always construct two Vanya functions that are localized at the different position of the unit cell and they have opposite spin. So uh, if there's any interaction, then it's possible that all those uh, charge density waves still spontaneously uh, develop a a spin order. Um, so is that like yeah? So so here's the thing. Yeah. So so it turns out that if you have a Kramer's pair of bands, that is, if you if you constructed your effective model with a Kramer's pair of bands, you will always be able to find exponentially localized one-year functions with the same one-year center if the two bands are topologically trivial. Okay, so the statement is that if your bands are topologically trivial and they form a Kramer's pair, you will always be able to exponentially localize them with the same one year center. So you can maybe perform some one year transformations, but if you, at the end of the day, get them to be exponentially localized, they will share the same one year center. But the problem is, the, the problem is when they're topologically non trivial, that is, if they have a churn number of plus one and minus one even if you try to smoothen out your one-year functions as much as possible, you will never get them to share the same one-year center. And that's the statement here. Okay, God, thank you very much. Yeah. So, Anu, yeah. you have a question? I have yeah. a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Go ahead. I wonder, uh, in these base, in, in these band structure calculations, uh, do you take into account completely the the degeneracy of the D bands of the vanadium or not? Uh, so you mean whether in the DFT calculations, uh, the D orbitals are degenerate? Yeah. Um, I am not sure, uh, to be honest with you, but uh, it seems like if you look at uh, uh, the papers with, which describe DFT, it doesn't seem like they are giving any preference to one D orbital over the other. So, so it so seems you, like, yeah. So you consider like, like a single orbital on the vanadium? Well, there is a predominantly, depending on what direction. So you have all the five orbitals in the DFT calculations, uh, but uh, what contributes close to the Fermi surface, uh, it's not the, so for example, the, uh, depending on which direct, which point, high symmetry point you are, you can have the dxy contribution and in some cases dxz dyz contributions but but in the calculations that you do with your uh, uh, simplified model you, uh, you you do not take into account this difference ah sure so in our calculations we wrote a minimal model that is we did not take into account the uh, the d orbital character but simply the fact that we want to have topologically non-trivial bands in the effective low energy model. In, in principle, one can also do this with d orbitals to obtain the non-trivial character of the bands. But for simplicity, given that this was the first work that uh, is bringing out this physics, we stuck to the simpler case of isotropic orbitals. So in the real situation, maybe a single band of the d, of the d uh, multiply to would be the one giving the Kagome character and the others would, would be smoother. Um, in the band structure calculations, it seems like the splitting is quite small. And so even if there are multiple, even if there is one D, even if there is one band, you can, it will always have its Kramer's doublet crossing the Fermi level. So you're assured that if your spin orbit coupling is weak enough, yeah, okay. You will have at least two bands uh, uh, crossing the Fermi level. So the problem of the single band crossing the Fermi level is not uh, probably uh, realized in this case, 
but I think it's an outstanding theoretical problem because you know uh, what happens when you have a single band. I I don't know the answer to that question. Maybe I can just add one particular point in regard to what the Henry uh, asked. I, uh, th this aspect of optical selectivity, uh, Henry, I think that's what you are alluding to, ha has not really been addressed. J just uh, what we've done is so just to capture the topology uh, with the simplest possible uh, band structure. But uh, it could be interesting to look at. So, Multiple D bands. I'm, I am sure there is there is a difference between systems. Uh, maybe the the cobalt case is different from the Vallejo one. I don't know. Right. The 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 binaries could be somewhat different uh, from the ternaries, etc. So that that's a rich aspect, which uh, certainly is. Uh, and, and I feel that the case I am working on, which is the the sodium cobaltate, in which we have. A, Kagome uh, phase is also a dis distinct one in the sense that uh, in our case we do not have the equivalent of the of the of the tin, so we are not probably of the tin or of the antimony, so we are not probably not in a situation where the uh, where the the W is strongly affected by uh, by uh, transfer. So so in, in our case, I think we are much more correlated. We we would be on on the right side. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Situations well, okay. can be very different. The geometry and the topology can play a role, but very different one, depending on the relative strength of the, of the, uh, of the correlations, the U uh, to, the, to, to W. Yeah, fully agreed. Mm -hmm. Okay, Victor, do you have a question? Uh, yes, uh, so Victor Akavenka. So my question is, um, um, now, this time reversal breaking uh, in your model comes from spins, right? Uh, in, in some way. But in general, generally speaking, it might also come from orbital degrees of freedom, some sort of loop currents or something like this. So my question yeah. is whether these kind of loop currents or anything orbital currents, are, are they kind of anyhow present in your model? And more generally, are these other scenarios discussed in the literature, you know, that time reversal comes from kind of loop currents, or orbital degrees of freedom? Yeah, so I think that's a good question. Uh, so in our case, the uh, broken time reversal symmetry is not coming from the orbital component, but it's coming from the spin component. And you're right, there are uh, multiple instances of uh, uh, authors uh, suggesting that the orbital currents are also important to give rise to the broken time reversal symmetry. Now, of course, the question is, how do you pro probably distinguish the two experimentally? And I think so far, um, USR has not addressed this question, uh, but it, in in no, no, one way USR, to I thought USR claimed there's no spin component. I mean, they claim there's orbital component, but it's in the plane, which which is sort of a contradicting to to what one naively expect an orbital current, you know, because orbital current would expect to have a moment along the c-axis. No, but I, I, well, exactly. So in this case, how do you know that the uh, the moment is only along the c-axis, right? So from this no, 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 scenario. The, moment, the moment is not along the C axis. Based on USR, they claim the moment is in the plane. Yeah, but if if but if, if you had a if, if yeah if you had a if you had a current in plane, then you would expect that your moment is out of plane. I know. Uh, yeah. this, this, so, this is something. This is something that uh, I mean. I don't think USR people was able to explain. At least not to me. I mean, to my satisfaction. Yeah. So in, in that sense, our result is actually consistent with the MUSR. Oh, yeah, but, but also, also it's the, too early if, to, if, Sorry, I interrupt you. It's still, maybe, it's still maybe related question uh, to what Victor asked. What is actually the model you consider? What is the Hamiltonian? You know, uh, in all days, actually, in Landau seminars in Moscow, there was a typical question, actually, uh, after five minutes. The, the Hamiltonian, does it have a form? Yeah, this is the Hamiltonian. This is the high energy UV Hamiltonian. Uh, and generate, okay. Uh, and uh, the anomalous average you consider actually this C dagger C excitonic like average, this uh, same spins or different spins? Same orbital index or different orbital index? Uh, so uh, this. If I uh, chart density wave, it's always uh, something like anomalous average of C dagger C. Yes. With some, uh, with some, uh, some indices. So yes. what? Is really your enormous energy. 
So in our case, indices, what are momentum, what are orbital indices, and what are spin indices? Sure. So in in the actual calculations, you'll see that the definition here uh, for the spin operator, we have uh, two different spins. So this is a spin along the x direction. So you have spin up and spin down in the original Kagome high energy Hamiltonian. And if you transform it into the one year orbital basis, that is, uh, you will simply have the difference between the two densities corresponding to the spin. So you're right. So the spin, the spin structure here is, 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 is shown here. So you have an up and a down. So this kind of triplet pairing, yeah? Yeah, so the-, the Component the, of triplet, component of a triplet. Yeah, so the ground state is this. So I think this should answer your question, right? So there is an orbital component corresponding, well, quote unquote, orbital component coming from the site index for the Kagome, and you have the spin index. So on one of the sides, you have a spin pointing along the X direction, and in the other two, you have the moment to be smaller. And then on the other side, you have the spin pointing in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. so how, how Just to be I... clear, <laughs> sorry. So, so it looks like you have other parameters like on site or the parameter, right? So there may be charge modulation on site, there may be spin modulation on site, but it's defined sort of on site as opposed to like, like, like bond order, you know, there could be bond order or bond current. Uh, right. That's not, that's, that's, that's not the case in your model, right? Correct. That's not the case in our model. So we are considering the endpoint order coming from a uh, uh, collinear order for on site tropes. So how, how can you know, but they didn't have a different spins when they're the same thing? Sorry? How, how can you have vanadium to have a different spins while they're the same thing? Why not? I mean, I, I mean, can you physically, I mean, well, if you think about spin, there's some unpaired electrons on, um, associated with a particular vanadium, right? I mean, I thought these three vanadiums are equivalent. No, but uh, in, in the ground state, so our claim is that in the ground state, you are having a modulated spin and a charge. So yes, you start with a spin uh, you start with a high energy state above the CDW mm -hmm. temperature where they're equivalent, but this is spontaneously broken. But okay. that should be seen by uh, experiments like NMR. Yeah, but but there's no there's no evidence so far. I mean, once you have spins like that, you should see you know oscillation in MSR, which they have not seen. Well, uh, Chimel, you have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, more NMR. Okay, if I could just uh, add a remark on what the Victor uh, asked about. Um, so, so the point is that if you don't consider topology, you could in principle consider some combination of on-site and bound uh, charge density wave and some uh, one Q versus uh, multiple Q uh, charge density waves to get the uh, orbital current. And, uh, um, and that's one way, legitimate way of getting uh, breaking of time versus uh, symmetry. Uh, what the China is saying is that without invoking multiple queues, even in a single queue state, because of the interplay between topology and correlations, you, you can have a density wave phase that very naturally uh, break time versus uh, symmetry. It doesn't prevent further mixing of the different queues uh, to get the, the orbital component as well. And uh, uh, in the end, um, you would have consequences of you know, how much uh, uh, of the moment would be pointing along which direction. And uh, the MIRSI experiment is like three day old. And uh, so, so I think uh, it could be uh, tested uh, uh, in the future as to- uh, I think an, an, an MR should, should so, see but, uh, immediately the difference. But uh, on this question of how much a spin uh, versus that can be mixed in a charge density wave. Chanda, do you want a uh, uh, comment? Yes, I can maybe interject. Ch Ch also, this was a parameter which is shown. I guess it also breaks rotational symmetry, right? Because it picks only one Q uh, as so, opposed to like so three different Qs, right? The United States, which you're alluding to, uh, yes. mm -hmm. is very interesting. Uh, that mm -hmm. also will tell us uh, how much of mixing of the... Uh, it, it, M has three vectors, as Chanda said and right. uh, whether it's equal amplitude for the three Qs or at least different amplitudes for the three Qs can be tested by measuring the spatial anisotropies. And uh, I, I think that's too early.
to really say whether these materials have uh, nematic correlations or not, but it, it's, a, it's a yet another experimentally testable consequences as to, uh, so the, 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 the amount, the, the, this, which way the moment points uh, can be combined with the information of whether there's a pneumatic correlation or not uh, to give a, a full picture in the, in the experiment. But theoretically, the point is that this is a well-defined mechanism that if you have topological non-trivial bands, there's a very natural way of uh, breaking time versus symmetry. If you don't see time versus symmetry breaking, one would be concerned whether these topological non trivial bands are involved in forming the charge density wave or not. Right, and the important thing is that in this uh, work, we have not addressed uh, the fact that one endpoint could be more preferred over the other or not, right? So basically in our case, we have the three endpoint Q vectors to be degenerate, but in principle, as Chimiao said, that need not be the case, depending on what uh, uh, microscopic parameters we are interested in. Uh, yeah. Okay, so so we have uh, running uh, it's like 15 minutes too late, yeah, 18 minutes, yeah. So yeah, but that's, that's can, can I add a 30 seconds if you don't mind? Yeah, 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 okay, go this ahead. Question yeah. How can, I maybe, can I maybe just make very short uh, question to the previous picture? Uh, previous picture, actually, you started by discussing 1D systems, virus and so on. Can I say that your uh, structure you obtained finally is kind of combination of 2KF and 4KF? Um, occupied, empty, occupied, empty, but occupied sites uh, have pins left, right, left, right. So it's combination of 2KF and 4KF. Uh, it would be in 1D, for example. No, da Daniel. Uh, Is it correct interpretation or not? No. Daniel, these two components have the same Q. Yes. And that's because time versus symmetry is broken. Otherwise, one has to be uh, twice of the Q of the other. You're absolutely right. But because of broken time versus symmetry, they have the same Q. Now, I, I was going to uh, ask Pen Ching for uh, maybe 15 seconds. The, the amplitude of the spin component and uh, pertaining to whether NMR can see it or not, or even whether mu SR can see it or not, uh, depends on the strength of the spin orbit coupling. So, so Chandler model has uh, assumed a particular strength of spin orbit coupling, which affects the, determines the degree of mixing of the spin part into the right. uh, charge order. And in real life, uh, in, in these, uh, you know, vanadium-based system, presumably spin orbit coupling is like the ion-based system, which is uh, about, uh, uh, you know, 5% of the bandwidth uh, also. So, so, uh, so that, that to, uh, I mean, when we wrote the paper, actually there was no, uh, the first MIRSA experiment didn't see any signal. So we could only say that, you know, we would expect a spin component, but the, the amount is below the MIRSA resolution, but now MIRSA has seen it. But this already like a detail, but I just wanted to understand uh, just conceptually, uh, yeah. ideologically yeah. to say, it looks like it's really a combination of 2K and 4K or very similar at least to this one. Of course, actually in the real system. And, yeah, with uh, the exception that it's supposed to have the same Q, you could, you could think of the way, uh, Daniel, that you, you are describing. Okay, I mean, if there's no further question, let's, let's thank- uh, The last thing I will add is that in the band structure calculations, the effect of spin orbit coupling was just small enough to induce a direct gap and not more. So just, just to add to Chimiao's point about the degree of uh, uh, the magnitude of the local moment and spin orbit coupling. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Yeah, let's thank, thank let's thank so Chad and yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much.